This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davey Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 105, continuing the history of six-day races, running as far as you can in six days. This episode will tell the story of the six-day rematch between Daniel O'Leary and Edward Payson Weston in 1877 in London, England, the most followed sporting event of that year. Thanks to all of you who have signed up to be an Ultra Running History patron. Your monthly support keeps me going. It really does. Go to ultrarunninghistory.com slash member to become my partner. That's ultrarunninghistory.com slash member to become a Patreon member and help out. In America, 1876 had been a loopy six-day race year. With at least 18 six-day races held. Interest was high, but there were also skeptics. With some criticism swirling around Daniel O'Leary of Chicago, he wanted to show England that he was the true champion ultra-running pedestrian of the world, not Edward Payson Weston, who had been winning over the British respect and their money for months. By going to England, O'Leary would eventually face off in a rematch with Weston for their historic second six-day race. O'Leary had crushed Weston in their first match. The rematch would receive nearly as much attention as the Ali vs. Frazier 2 boxing match that took place 97 years later in Madison Square Garden. I'm stronger, I'm gonna be dancing, floating like a butterfly, stinging like a bee, and I predict that this shall be no contest. In late September 1876, while O'Leary was on a ship crossing the Atlantic, Weston finally succeeded in reaching 500 miles in six days for the second time. This was accomplished at the ice skating rink in Liverpool, and he went a little further to 500 and a half miles. O'Leary arrived in London a few days later and immediately tried to help the British understand that he was the true pedestrian champion, not Weston. O'Leary said, I am desirous of forever settling the question. Who shall be the champion pedestrian of the world? Should Weston be desirous of entering into a side-by-side contest of 500 miles with me? I hereby agree to give him a start of 25 miles in that distance. Weston ignored O'Leary's challenge and didn't want to share the spotlight that was shining on him by the British public. (coughs) Frustrated that a race could not be scheduled, O'Leary wanted to prove to the British that he was better than Weston. He also went to Liverpool, determined to beat Weston's recent mark, set there of 500.5 miles in six days. On October 16, 1876, he walked in the same skating rink in Liverpool on a track measuring 11 laps to a mile. The English were skeptical of this newcomer, but commented, He is much prettier and a more rapid walker than Weston, but his dress is not near so neat as that worn by Weston. Yes, to the British, how you looked was just as important as how you performed. Interest in Liverpool was intense. Trams were filled, taking spectators to the rink where they would pay one shilling to watch day and night and be entertained by a band. O'Leary walked strongly. He usually walked with a pacer who helped him stay awake by chatting, and he reached 263 miles after three days despite being ill. Unable to take in solid food, he fueled mostly on soup and slops. On the last day, the building was so packed that hundreds had to be turned away. The crowd swayed to and fro like a mighty wave, and the noise, excitement, and confusion which prevailed were indescribable. The enclosure was crowded to such a degree that it was almost a matter of impossibility for one to budge from the spot where he located himself. O'Leary reached 500 miles in a little less than 143 miles and 502 miles in 143 hours and 46 minutes, his fourth time reaching the 500 mile distance, and just a mile short of his world record of 503 miles. After the finish, he was cheered by a large audience of Irishmen for about four minutes with repeated cries of, O'Leary! O'Leary! 
O'Leary. The British press properly recognized the feat. This is perhaps the most wonderful feat that has ever been chronicled in the history of pedestrianism. It is doubly remarkable from the fact that it completely eclipses Weston's famous walk on a recent occasion. Yes, O'Leary successfully knocked Weston down a peg or two from his pedestal, and the sporting community wanted to witness a showdown between the two. The British now had someone to compare against Weston, and words of criticism were printed about him. Weston's walking was utterly opposed to all preconceived ideas among Englishmen of what pedestrianism should be. His fantastic dress was accepted as a piece of Yankeeism, which might be forgiven, but the rollicking style in which he tripped around the path was never favorably regarded. O'Leary's style is much after the English model, and was decidedly in favor with the majority of those who witnessed the performance. Weston was still dodging O'Leary when he participated in a six-day race at the Agricultural Hall in London called Edward Payson Weston Against the World. There clearly were no true British challenges for either Weston or O'Leary in the six-day race, so someone came up with the idea for Weston to race against a relay consisting of some of the best long-distance walkers in England. On December 18, 1876, Weston raced against George Ide, who recently set a 50-mile world record in 8 hours and 19 minutes, George Perry, a mason of Manchester who recently walked 114 miles in 24 hours, and Peter Crossland, a knife maker known as the Sharp Sheffield Blade. He was the 24-hour world record holder with 120 miles set three months earlier. None of these walkers trained specifically for the event, and they would walk two days each. After the first 48 hours, Weston walked 186 miles to Ide's 153, but as Weston slowed and a fresh George Perry walked, the relay caught up after another 12 hours and it was neck and neck through three days. In the end, the relay won with 487 miles to Weston's 460 miles. While Weston's relay race was taking place, it was revealed that a great walking contest was in the works for 1877 at the Agricultural Hall in London. The chance to win up to 1,000 pounds and a significant portion of the gate money was too much for Weston to ignore. Weston loved riches. O'Leary quickly sent a check for 100 pounds to secure his spot in the race. It was reported, A gigantic match of this description is unequaled in the annals of pedestrianism. In early January 1877, both Weston and O'Leary signed articles of agreement for the match to be held in April. People back in Chicago heard about the planned race and were wagering that the race would never take place, that Weston would back out. In early March 1877, to everyone's excitement, Sporting Life announced that the Weston O'Leary rematch agreements were finalized. The match is a genuine one in every respect, and every man is sure to have a fair field and no favor, which is all either they or their supporters require. It would be held in the Agricultural Hall in London. Two bands were hired to play from 5 a.m. to midnight, and the two walkers would oversee which tunes were played in alternate hours. Two tracks were laid down, composed of soil, brick dust, and sawdust, but the surface seemed more like potter's clay, with no spring to it, similar to walking on a carpet. The outer track was seven laps to a mile, and the inner 6.5. A large scoreboard was put up in clear view of the public that would be maintained by four lap counters. New rules were added to disallow pacers, which O'Leary often used. Each man must walk alone and no attendant to be allowed to go more than 25 yards at a time with either competitor, and then only for the purpose of handling refreshments. The race would adhere to strict walking standards, where they could not have both feet off the ground at the same time. 
The excitement grew. The wagering was huge, with O'Leary as a slight favorite. No Brits would be competing, owing to that the Englishmen were invariably out of training. Pre-race hype included. There seems every probability of the match resulting in one of the most exciting contests ever witnessed. O'Leary's speed will be balanced by Weston's extraordinary power of endurance and wonderful ability of resisting that intense feeling of drowsiness generally experienced by all men undergoing long and continued exertion. The much-anticipated O'Leary-Weston Race 2 started at 12.05 a.m. on April 2, 1877. Both went off at a steady pace. Nearly every newspaper in Great Britain covered the blow-by-blow -blow progress. O'Leary quickly opened up a one-mile lead after one hour. As dawn arrived, the gas lights in the building were doused out, and the band arrived to play. Because it was a bank holiday, the day after Easter, only a sparse crowd arrived. When the two competitors came near each other, the crowd cheered, and a few shrill whistles accompanied by the cry of, Go it, Weston! Go it, O'Leary! O'Leary drank some beer that disagreed with him, and forced him to make an early stop. For the rest of the race, he ate mostly grapes, figs, and strawberries. After 63 miles in 12 hours, O'Leary was seized with vomiting and had to stop for nearly an hour. <coughs> Weston took the lead at that point and reached 100 miles in 20 hours and 6 minutes, and O'Leary arrived there at 20 hours 24 minutes. It continued to be a very close race. As the evening advanced, the crowd thickened and watched with astonishment, mingled with pity for the two men that continued to plod around the hall. The crowd was mostly orderly, and the police present had absolutely nothing to do but to saunter about and, like the rest, watch the two men on the path. When they retired to sleep after the first 24 hours, Weston was at 116 miles to O'Leary's 114 miles. On day two, both walkers did not sleep long. They came back out during the wee hours of the morning, walking quietly on through the deserted hall, in which the only signs of life were the judge's box, and here and there someone nodding in a chair placed in convenient corners. O'Leary turned the tables on Weston, and after 37 hours was in the lead with 163 miles. As O'Leary increased his lead, Weston decided to stick to his schedule and pacing chart. He believed that 506 miles would win the race, and he had a solid plan to achieve it. He fueled on strong beef tea, raw eggs beaten up, and jelly. During the evening, there was great excitement as O'Leary approached 200 miles. He reached a new world record time of 45 hours, 21 minutes, crushing the old world record by more than an hour. Seldom before, notwithstanding the many exciting scenes witnessed in the agricultural hall, has its roof rung to louder shouts than greeted the posting of this fact on the scoring board. After day two, O'Leary had set a 48-hour world record of 207 miles, with Weston 13 miles behind. During the early morning of day three, O'Leary had the track to himself for nearly three hours, stretching his lead to 25 miles. The press commented on the difference between the two. O'Leary is a tall, broad-shouldered man, with a high forehead, stern countenance, and in possession of a figure that a sculptor would delight to model. <coughs> On the other hand, Weston is a thin, wiry little man with a peculiar comical look, and whose every movement is suggestive of his limbs being set on springs. People wondered why O'Leary always walked clutching a corn cob in each hand during his races. He replied, I think it is habit as anything else. They probably absorb the perspiration and keep the hands from swelling. In walking, I hold my arms up and work my hands across each other, toward the opposite shoulder. I use the cobs first because a light grip on them seemed to make me solid. That got me into the habit of walking with cobs, and I never had been able to break myself of it. 
Edward Payson Weston, he had what was described as a wobbly walk. And uh, we think it was a lot like what uh, modern race walkers do, where they kind of swivel their hips like that, and move like that. Um, on the other hand, Daniel O'Leary, he had a, a, a more a workmanlike walk. Uh, they said his arms moved like pistons, and so he would just keep his head straight down, and he just walked like this for days and days and hours. The band was having a great time. They played the liveliest of tunes, in which a chorus was a sort of barbaric woohoo by the performers as Weston and O'Leary were spurting side by side in the intense delight of the spectators, who shouted each name of his favorite, while hail rattled on the roof and thunder rolled overhead at intervals and lightning illuminated the darkened hall. For 72 hours, O'Leary set a new world record of 294 miles, with Weston 10 miles behind. On day 4, O'Leary increased his lead back to 25 miles, but Weston was expected to catch up. It became evident that O'Leary was starting to struggle dangerously, and his attendants strongly urged him to stop for some rest. Stop! Rest! He refused and motioned his friends away with a wave of his arm. But he finally stopped in the early afternoon with 350 miles and a 27-mile lead. He fell into a deep sleep for about four hours. Weston continued and cut 15 miles into that lead before O'Leary returned. In the evening, the crowd was bigger than ever. Those in the middle of the hall would run across the oval to watch the two men each time they came anywhere close to each other. At times during a lively tune of the band, Weston would put on spurts and onlookers commented that it looked like he was running. One of the judges objected to Weston's style and requested that one lap be taken from him, but the objection was overruled by the other judges. After four days, O'Leary reached 370 miles to Weston's 353. O'Leary continued on steadily on day five. When it was his turn to oversee the band tunes, he chose to have them not play at all because the music made Weston increase his speed. When one of the walkers was off the track, the band was not allowed to play to let the walker sleep. O'Leary was pretty devious, planning his rest during an hour when Weston had control of the band but was then not allowed to let them play. The crowd was huge. There was about 5,000 and the inner circle was crowded, several ladies being present and evidently took a keen interest in the proceedings. Weston, although limping and evidently fatigued, would not stop and determined to try and wear down his opponent. At the end of day five, O'Leary had a lead of 14 miles. 453 to 439. The attendance was enormous on the final day, with more than 20,000 going through the turnstiles, even though the price of admission had strategically been raised. By noon, it was very evident that Weston would not be able to catch O'Leary, who had a 17-mile lead. But O'Leary was also suffering during the morning with a badly pained left shoulder, that caused him to do the ultra lean to the left for a while. When he reached 498 miles, Sir John Astley, Weston's backer, told O'Leary's backers that they could stop the race if they wanted, that Weston was defeated. He later said that Weston had been weeping and could barely move, but there was no way O'Leary wanted to stop. No way! At 1.50 p.m., O'Leary crossed the 500-mile mark, setting a new world time record for that distance. The cheering and excitement when the board announced his 500th mile baffles all description. Many of those inside the enclosure ran around with O'Leary waving their hats and handkerchiefs. Once O'Leary exceeded his own world record of 503 miles in six days, he looked very shaky, so his attendants took him off the track for a rest. When he returned about 35 minutes later, his pace was very slow and he took more rests. Weston passed 500 miles at 8.15 p.m. Curiously, he then pushed a garden roller in front of him, assisting him to walk. Huh? Near the end, O'Leary came out wearing an overcoat and walked two laps with his backer, Haig, and another friend. 
but since pacers were not allowed, those two laps were stricken from his total. The crowd was impressed with Weston's solid finish with honor, lapping O'Leary many times when he knew he could not win. Both quit with an hour to go. The final historic tally at the end of six days was O'Leary, 519 miles, 1585 yards, a new world record, to Weston's 510. O'Leary was presented with no less than six bouquets by lady admirers, while Weston received three. Weston, upon leaving the track, entered a cab and drove away at once, thus disappointing the spectators that expected him, as usual, to make a speech. O'Leary stayed and thanked the judges and officials for the fair race they conducted. Thank you, thank you. He also thanked Weston, because if it had not been for him, he would have never known his own power. Weston recovered quickly and went out for a walk the next morning. O'Leary stayed on a sofa with a sore foot and a terribly blistered heel. Just like their first race, Weston excuses later came out. He said he had experienced an accident on day two that ruined his race. He also severely underestimated how much O'Leary had improved since their first race. He quickly challenged O'Leary for another rematch to be held in a month. It did not happen. However, the Weston O'Leary rivalry catapulted pedestrianism into its golden age. And you find out early that it's these rivalries that help fuel the sport. And so when you had Weston, there was interest, it was a fascination, but it really elevated the interest when he was defeated. The English were impressed. These American pedestrians both have extraordinary endurance, capable of walking distances that have taken most persons by surprise and quite revolutionized pedestrianism in this country. O'Leary performed a task that a few years back was thought as incredible and as improbable as the feat of swimming the English Channel. There were also critics. The illogical law permits thousands of people to assemble and thousands of shillings to be paid at the agricultural hall, while a coup of madmen, under the pretense of sport, shortened their lives allotted to them in the presence of police as surely as do suicides from the bridge of the Thames. As to shorten lives, it should be pointed out that Weston lived to be 90 years old and O'Leary reached 86. Normal life expectancy at the time was about 60. The race deeply impacted Sir John Astley, who crewed Weston, and had only about two to three hours of sleep per day. He said, I never was more excited over any performance, and the number of cigars I went through was a record. It is believed that Astley lost a huge amount of money on the race, but the experience resulted in a deep enthusiasm for the sport. He would take it to levels that would have been impossible without him. After visiting his Irish homeland, O'Leary boarded the steamer Wisconsin on May 12, 1877, and arrived back in America richer by about $14,000, or about $375,000 value today. He was a very rich man. Weston stayed in England for more than two years, licking his wounded pride and having mixed success in additional walking exhibitions. With a Leary gone, there was weaker competition in England compared to America and more money to win. It made sense for him to stay. But the stage was set for the golden age of six-day races to give birth in England. Stay tuned for the story of the historic first Astley Belt Race. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances. <laughs>